We are riddled with blemishes and spots that the Bible calls sin. And because of our sinfulness, we need a sinless Savior. From the moment you placed your faith in Christ, God the Father looks upon you as if he's looking at his son. Because God is a merciful father, but he's also an honorable judge. And he has to remain true to his word in order to remain true to his character and to his holiness. We're just going to dive right in. And I want to talk first and foremost about the supremacy of Jesus' birth. Why is Jesus' conception, his birth, unique from every other human being? Well, Matthew 1 and Luke 1 uh, tells us of Jesus' miraculous conception. Mary was dumbfounded and didn't know how this was going to come about. And in Luke 1.35, the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child will be called holy, the Son of God. This is a fulfillment of Isaiah 7.14. I'm sure many, most if not all of y'all are aware of Isaiah 7.14 that Matthew quotes in his gospel. And in verse 20, uh, chapter 1, verse 23, he quotes Isaiah 7.14. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Jesus is God clothed in human flesh. This is important for us to understand. At Jesus' conception, the eternal Son of God, who had a divine nature, came to earth and joined his divine nature with a human nature in the one person, Jesus, who is the Christ. Jesus has two natures. He is fully human and he is fully divine. So this leads to the question. This leads to the so what. Okay, we, we, we're familiar with that. Every Christmas time we focus on these pas- passages. But why did the virgin birth have to happen? Why did God's eternal son have to come to earth to become the human being whom we call Jesus? Well, the answer is, is, is as simple as it is profound. What we need to know is that there is an infinite chasm, immeasurable chasm, between the holiness of God and the sinfulness of mankind. Human sin, our sin, is responsible for this infinite chasm. The problem is we're finite. We're just, we're just creatures. We're not the creator. We're creatures. We've been made by God, and we have limitations. And our sin has rendered us helpless to bridge this infinite chasm. Only God, who is infinitely holy, could bridge this chasm for us. So what should be our response to Jesus' birth? I would say if you have yet to put your faith in Christ, to please carefully consider Romans 6, 23. It reads, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Do we have the... Okay, I want you to, before we move to the next slide, go back to the beginning where it says, for the wages of sin is death. We need to understand this is talking about more than physical death. Because of sin in the world, all of us are going to die unless Christ returns. But what this is talking about is spiritual death. Hear hear me closely, which means um, separation from God, under his judgment forever. Separation from God under his judgment forever. So go to the, if you go to the next slide, I want to, I want to show you all something. This is as simple, I think, as, as it can be explained, especially going through using this verse. On one side, we have wages. These are the things that we're earning every time we sin, and it is contributing to our death. Do you all see that? It's a straight line down. Now look over here on the other side. We have a free gift. It's through Jesus Christ, not through sin, but Jesus Christ, and it's eternal life. Those are the two sides. 
And the cross of Christ is the only thing that can bridge us from here, from earning eternal death to God and eternal life. Um, Acts 4.12 says, And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Jesus Christ is the only Savior the world will ever know. To those of us who believe, I want to, I want to encourage you to do more what you've already been doing this morning, and that is worship him is to worship him. This is the response. Guys, gals, this is the response of the shepherds and the wise men when they came to the infant, the baby, Jesus who was born king. In Luke 2.20, it says of the shepherds, they returned glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. Months later, the wise men came. And in Matthew 2.11, it says, And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. The first right response to knowing who Jesus is, to knowing that Jesus is our king, is to worship him. The miracle of the incarnation proved Jesus' birth, and our right response to that is faith and worship. Our second observation is the supremacy of Jesus' life. Now, in actuality, we could spend many, many, many weeks talking about the supremacy of Jesus' life. So in an overarching view, I want to speak of his sinlessness and his obedience to the Father. In 1 Peter 2.22, the apostle Peter says, Jesus committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. In Hebrews 4.15, the author st states, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with us in our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. And friends, that is a great comfort for me. I still struggle with sin. I, I love the Lord, and I am, on a, I am on fire for him. I'm lit for him, okay? I'm lit for him. I, I made a, a slight detour this weekend, an 8,000-mile de detour, to come, to, he to come here and talk about um, our risen king. Um, but I still struggle with sin, and it is wonderful to know that Jesus is our faithful high priest who can sympathize with us, having been tempted but not sinning. He's able to sympathize with, with, with us and lead us down a path that is honoring to God. 1 John 3, 5 simply says, Jesus appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. Not only was Jesus without sin, but he lived a life of perfect obedience to the Father. And this is very important. When we talk about following Jesus, listen, it's not just about us believing, Jesus, believing in Jesus, it's about we want to believe Jesus as well. Do you understand? We believe, we put our faith in him for salvation. But Jesus is not simply looking for us to put our faith in him. He's wanting us to follow him. He's wanting, he, he gave his life away. He's wanting us to give our life away for his namesake. So listen to the words in John 5, 19. Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of his own accord but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. In John 6, 38, Jesus testifies the reason for this. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And that needs to be our outlook as well. Christ Jesus has saved us and called us out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of his marvelous light. And we are to follow him as he followed the Father in obedience. So this begs the question. We, I, I think we all know this, that what I just said is true, that he was sinless and that he walked in perfect obedience. But why was that necessary? Well, friends, it was necessary because God is perfect and without sin. Isaiah 6.3, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. 
The whole earth is full of his glory. Revelation 4.8. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was, who is, and who is to come. Any permanent offering to him for sin must be perfect and without sin as well. Prior to the incarnation, when we look back into the Old Testament, we see that God had arranged for animal, that animal sacrifices be given as an atonement for sin. But they had to be without blemish or spot. Y'all remember that? You remember reading about that in Exodus and Leviticus? They had to be without blemish or spot. Now, I want you to notice the connection that the apostle Peter makes about that to Jesus. In 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, he says, I'm, I'm, it, this is a part of the verse, we were ransomed with the precious blood of Jesus like that of a lamb without blemish and without spot. John 1, 29 tells us, uh, John the Baptist proclaims, behold, the lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. But unlike Jesus, who is without sin, Romans 3.23 tells us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, I want you to know this is the greatest understatement in all of Scripture. All have sinned, that's not the overstatement or understatement. We all, we've all sinned and fallen short. Earlier I mentioned there's an infinite chasm, truthfully, between the holiness of God and the sinfulness of men. We are riddled with blemishes and spots that the Bible calls sin. And because of our sinfulness, we need a sinless Savior. If Jesus was to be the Savior of mankind, he had to be holy and sinless as well. And he demonstrates this through his perfect life of obedience to the Father. So what should be our response to Jesus' perfect and sinless life? Well, surprise, surprise, if you've not done so, confess your sin. Ask for forgiveness and place your faith in Jesus Christ. But to those of us who believe, I want us to live out Jesus' words in Mark 1230. He was asked, what is the greatest commandment? And here is Jesus affirming to us, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. I would also encourage us to confess our sins daily. If we're honest with ourselves, we still struggle with sin. And just like we regularly need to take a shower to remove the dirt and impurities from our skin, we need to do the same in our spiritual walk with God. So I find 1 John 1, 8 and 9, it's helpful if you're coming to saving faith, and it's helpful in your daily walk with the Lord to be cleansed. It reads, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Jesus' sinlessness and his complete obedience proves the supremacy of his life. And our response to Jesus' extraordinary life is faith and obedience unto God. Our third observation is the supremacy of Jesus' death. Why is Jesus' death truly unique from every other human being? Well, Jesus' death by crucifixion on the cross is in all four Gospels, and it's literally the, the subject of hundreds of verses throughout the, um, the New Testament. But I want to read along one verse in particular. It's Matthew 27, beginning in verse 28. And they, or the soldiers, stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit on him. And took the reed and struck him in the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe, put, him, put his own clothes on him, and led him away to crucify him. 
That day that Jesus was killed will forever be the darkest day in human history. On the day that Jesus died, this is very important, on the day that Jesus died, God's holy wrath, his righteous indignation for our sin was placed upon his sinless son. Do you see the reason for the sinlessness? It prepared him to be the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world. All of this connects together because God is, is, is consistent and cohesive and he's true. His word is true. Hebrews 9.22 reads, Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. But there's one thing that is often missing when we talk about the crucifixion and, and his death on the cross. And it's this. The spiritual agony Jesus experienced far exceeded his physical pain. When we think of the cross, we think of you know, the, the shed blood, we think of the nails, we think of the, the suffering and the dying, and those were horrific. There's, there's no, there's no, there's no short-selling that at all. It's one of the most gr uh, gruesome and inhumane, cruel ways to die. Not taken away from that. But Jesus' primary agony, his primary agony, was that when he took on our sin, and the Father brought the curse, or brought our, the penalty for our sin, and placed it on his Son, there was a moment in a spiritual sense of separation between Father and Son. Something unheard of, unspeakably unheard of in the past, something that would never happen again in the future, but for, I believe, for three hours, he became accursed for us. I think this truth is captured most eloquently in Jesus Christ on the cross in Matthew 27, 46. He says, Eli, Eli, Lama Sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Even the skies darkened from noon to three as Jesus endured separation from our Heavenly Father for our sin. The crucifixion was Jesus' final act of obedience. He, uh, Philippians 2 8 reads, of, this, of God's Son, being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. But there's another side to this cross story. It's also the greatest expression of, of God's mercy, grace, and love that the world has ever known. Romans 5.8 says, But God shows his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And this is why refer, we refer to the day of Christ's crucifixion as Good Friday. It's good for us. It is good for us. During this time on the cross... 2 Corinthians 5.21 tells us that for our sake, God made Jesus to be sin, and that is, he took on our sin, Jesus who knew no sin, so that in him, by our faith in him, we might become the righteousness of God. And to understand the magnitude of this truth, I want you to envision a canister, like a trash can, and that it's full to the brim, page after page after page after page of all of your sins against God. I've got a canister too, by the way, okay? Or I had a canister. When you placed your faith in Jesus Christ, his perfect life, and his death on your behalf, two things happened. Number one, God empties out that canister. He pours it out. All of the sins, past, present, and future, the penalty for those sins, is poured out of that canister. Now, this doesn't mean that there aren't consequences for our sin today. In, in the here and now, God disciplines those whom he loves. We don't have to go any further than the Old Testament to see that God will discipline his people. He will discipline his children. But what's missing is penalty for those who believe. The difference is that God's purpose 
for disciplining us is corrective. To draw us closer to him. But when, for those who die in their sins, the, the penalty is punitive. And it's punishment, and it draws, uh, drives us away from him. But Paul, speaking to believers in Romans 8, 1 says, There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And to that, I give a hearty amen. Amen? amen. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, we're still on the canister. So the canister has been poured out. Here's what happens. Number two, God then fills the empty canister with something that is priceless. The righteousness of God that is found in Jesus Christ. His perfect, sinless life and his unblemished, sacrificial death. From the moment you placed your faith in Christ, God the Father looks upon you as if he's looking at your son, at, I mean, at his son. Have you ever put on glasses, whether they're a shade or they're 3D glasses, or maybe they're, you know, they're, they're too strong and they make things blurry or they make things, uh, for some of us make it clearer? Glasses have a, have, a, have a big impact on what we see. And from the moment we put our faith in Christ, the Father looks at us through the lenses of his Son. Does that make sense? He sees Christ through first and through and into us. This is most certainly good news. And again, it's why we call the day of his crucifixion Good Friday. I want to, go, I want to share one more point about this, and I'm going to go to the, the fourth point today. I want to, I'm asking the question, why did Jesus, God's incarnate son, have to die? Quite simply, because God is a merciful father, but he's also an honorable judge. And he has to remain true to his word in order to remain true to his character and to his holiness. Jesus' death on the cross is the only way that God could exercise his justice for our sin and, as a result, save us from our sin. The first had to happen before the second could come to be. So let me look at this practically. When we sin... When, I'm sorry, when we are sinned against, we want justice. I mean, oh yeah, we want justice to be served. But when we sin, we want mercy. Will you be merciful to me? I'm so sorry. Now, our longing for both actually comes from God. Did you know that? After all, we've been made in his image. Jesus' death on the cross accomplished both. God's justice was upheld for sin. And as a result, God's mercy and forgiveness could be extended to all who believe. That's, that's some good stuff, isn't it? So what should be our response to his death? We need to acknowledge uh, that we're a sinner in need of a, a sinless Savior. And I would encourage those of you maybe who have yet to put your faith in Christ to let his sacrifice be your sacrifice. As a result, you will become a new creation in God's eyes, a new set of lenses. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. So to those of us who believe, I want to encourage us to commit a life of sacrificial devotion to the one who sacrificed his life for us. If you were about to die and somebody rescued you, whether it's from a fire or from drowning, you're, two things instinctively, two things are going to come out of you once you've got, kind of caught your breath. You're going to thank the person who saved you. Thank you so much for doing that. And then something else is going to come out of your mouth. You're going to say, what can I do to repay you? What, can I ever, what, what could I ever do to demonstrate my gratitude and my thankfulness? Now, there's absolutely no way that we'll ever, ever, ever be able to repay God or his son for what Christ did on the cross. But Romans 12.1 gives us some very pro, uh, uh, pertinent instructions. Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. You know, there are many a Christian 
who will say, I'm willing to die for Jesus. But the reality is the Bible calls us first and foremost to live for Jesus. It's not to sit back and, you know what, if something comes, comes across my path and I have to acknowledge that I'm a believer and I know I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to die, then I'm, I'll do that. That's not actually what Jesus is calling us to do, even though it might come to that. He's calling for us to live for him. Jesus' sacrifice on the cross proves the supremacy of his death. And our right response to to this is to be a living sacrifice to him in honor of his incomparable sacrifice for us. Okay, lastly, our fourth final observation today is the supremacy of Jesus rising from the dead. Why is Jesus rising from the dead unique from those whom he raised from the dead himself prior to uh, Christ dying on the cross? Well, like the crucifixion, resurrection is recorded in all four Gospels and is the subject of hundreds of verses throughout the New Testament. Early Sunday morning, several courageous women, I love this, and this is how we know that God's word is true. Because if, a, if a, a, a ragtag bunch of guys were trying to get some religion off the ground in the first century uh, um, uh, uh, Near East, they would not have had women be the courageous ones going to the grave while they're hiding out for fear of their lives. They would have, the men would have been the courageous ones fighting off the guards and doing whatever needed to be done. But these women are coming out in, in the early morning hours and they're greeted by an angel. Matthew 28, 5 and 6, the angel said to the women, do not be afraid for I know that you, I know that you seek, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen from the dead. As he said, come see the place where he lay. That evening, Jesus entered a locked room where his disciples were hiding. In John 20, verses 19 and 20 says, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. If Jesus' death was the darkest day in human history, then his resurrection from the dead was the greatest, most glorious day that there has ever been. How can this be since Jesus himself raised people from the dead? Well, those whom Jesus raised from the dead return to their mortal bodies. They continue to age, and at some point, they died. However, Jesus Christ was raised from the grave in glory, with a glorified body. He is alive and will remain alive forevermore. Now, I asked Bromwell if y'all do the, uh, something that we do in the United States, where the pastor will say, he is risen, and then the congregation will say, he is risen indeed. Are y'all up for that? Y'all, are, you, are you familiar with that? He is risen. He is risen okay, come on, we can do it a little bit better. He is risen. He, is risen he has risen. He is risen One more. He has risen. He has risen Amen. Amen. Jesus is the first to receive a glorified body. His glorified body represents how one day we too who believe will be raised to glory as well. And we will live with him in a new, he- a new imperishable body forevermore. Romans 8.29 says, Jesus is the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. I added the sisters part, but it's, all, it's brethren. One day we will die physically, but Jesus' resurrection guarantees at his, that at his second coming, we too will be raised in glory. In the New International Version, and this goes to the title of my message today, Colossians 1.18 reads, And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, listen to this, and the firstborn from among the, the dead, so that, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. I love that. So why did Jesus have to be resurrected? Why couldn't Jesus just die on the cross and that be the end of it? Jesus' sacrifice for our sins was greater 
than the penalty for our sins. Without the resurrection, we, have, we would have no assurance that we've been forgiven and have no hope of eternal life. And that's not an overstatement. Those are the very statements from the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians uh, 15. Verses, we're going to look at 14 and 17, all that, although that whole chapter is important. Paul says, If Christ has not been raised from the dead, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. In verse 17, he goes on to say, If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you and I are still in our sins. 1 Peter 1.3, we read, According to God's, God's great mercy... He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection. The living hope isn't through the death. The living hope is through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Before, earlier I mentioned the disciples were hiding out. And Peter, even prior to that, denied Jesus three times. You all remember that? Which is what a heartbreaking moment you feel for Peter. You know he regretted it. However, just a few days later in Acts chapter 2, just days after, again, Jesus' resurrection, Peter gives one of the boldest and most profound messages in, the, in church history. And it led to the salvation of 3,000 people. This is from a guy who denied even knowing him a few weeks prior. And now he's, at the, he's on the footsteps of the temple, surrounded by those in opposition and leading 3,000 people to Christ. This dr- uh, dramatic transformation, the only answer for that is that Jesus Christ actually raised from the dead. Peter never denied Christ from that de- moment forward, and decades later he was martyred for his faith. But he never wavered in his belief. And he never recanted that he has seen, had seen the resurrected Lord. So what should be our response to Jesus' resurrection? Well, if you've let, you've yet to believe, guess what? I want you to put your faith in Jesus Christ. It's not enough just to be in general agreement with what I'm saying. Putting your faith means to trust in him and say, I'm going to commit my life to him and not my life to me. Romans 10, 9 reads... And by the way, I want you to notice the emphasis on the resurrection. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's that simple. And to those of us who believe, who've been born again to that living hope, I love Romans 6, 5. It says, for if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Therefore, let us maintain a steadfast hope in the goodness and faithfulness of God, no matter what may be your circumstances. Hebrews 10.23 says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Because of the resurrection, we have a hope that springs eternal. We have a hope that is greater than our struggles with sin. We have a hope that is greater than our money problems. We have a hope that is greater than natural disasters. We have a hope that is greater than our spiritual enemy. We have a hope that is greater than political distress. And we have a hope that is greater than sickness, disease, and death. And today, we who believe have the assurance of eternal life Thanks be to Jesus Christ, our resurrected Savior, Lord, and King. Jesus' resurrection from the dead proves the supremacy of his rising. He rose in glory, and one day we as well. Our right response to this is an unwavering hope in God. And for all of God's promises, for us to realize that all of God's promises will be yes when Christ returns. They're they're yes now. And we're experiencing some of the yes, but they will be yes in full to come. Well, friends, usually in almost always in a church this size, man, even with, even with the enthusiasm and the, just the ardent worship that we had, 
there's just frequently a person or two or three that, that again, has yet to put their faith in Christ. And from right, right where you're sitting, you don't, have to, you don't have to come down front, although I would love for you to come down front and let me just pray a prayer of blessing over you. But you can, you can acknowledge these things and say, Heavenly Father, I want Christ's life to be given in place of my life. So just to review, God's Son came to earth due to the infinite chasm between the holiness of God and our sinfulness. He bridged that chasm. God's Son lived a perfect and sinless life. And because all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Jesus is the only one who can bring us back to God. God's Son, the unblemished Lamb, died for our sins, and Jesus is the only one who can bring us back to God. If you died in your sins today, you will, you will have to endure a penalty for those sins. And that, as we talked about earlier, it's separation from God under his judgment forever. God's Son rose from the grave in victory and eternal glory. And Jesus' resurrection from the dead proves that his death for our sins satisfied the justice of a holy God. His re resurrection provides a living hope to those who believe. So uh, just for a moment, just, I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to ask yourself, do I believe what has been shared today? Do I actually truly believe it? And if I do believe it, have I put my faith in Jesus Christ as a result? And if not, well, what am I waiting for? If you feel the Holy Spirit leading you to do so, receive Jesus Christ right now. Lord Jesus, I want your life to replace my life. I want to be seen before my Creator and our Father in heaven through the lenses of your perfect and sinless life and your death on my behalf and your victorious resurrection. Place your faith and your trust in him. Only Jesus Christ can provide for the forgiveness of sins and eternal life. And I'm going to come down front. Amen. You can open your eyes. I'm going to come down front. And um, uh, anyone that wants to come down, um, especially if today's the day you put your faith in Christ, and I would just love to pray over you and um, this would be the start of a new day. And you too can become lit. I hope that for those of us who believe that we will take not just the truth, but the, the, the importance of these truths to heart and then take them, let's take them home with us. And then let's respond to those, the, to those truths and the importance of those truths with worship and praise and obedience and a life that honors Jesus Christ. He's the greatest treasure that the world will ever know. And we want to, we want to demonstrate that we believe that to be true by the way we live our life. Let me close this in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much. Thank you for this morning. Uh, Lord, thank you for the invitation uh, for us to be able to come to, to Nairobi this morning, to Destiny Life, and to be overwhelmed with blessing by the worship that took place this morning. I pray that we will walk out of here with a greater appreciation for Jesus Christ than we had when we got up this morning. From the worship to the truths that we just discussed, we would see that Jesus Christ is a living hope and that in him nothing can overcome us. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.